Hello folks, welcome back to World War II TV and a Saturday show. I've been out all day filming some content with JD for History Underground, but we're talking about my channel tonight. I've really enjoyed just talking to my guests, how I've been learning as we've gone along through this Husky series, different points of view, look at the same events. The American historian has one slant, Canadian historian has a different slant. Slant. It's, it's been really fascinating. But today it's all about the air. It's all about what's in the air power, in the skies. Alexander Fitzgerald Black is an author, historian. He's also the executive director of the Juno Beach Association. And his uh, book uh, is about, well, you can see it at the link below, Eagles Over Husky is all about the air power. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So I'm going to bring Alex in now. So good afternoon, sir. How are you today? Very well, Woody. How are you? I'm good. I'm a bit tired, but I'm good. So, um, yeah, as I said there, you know, that, that different range of views and the air power aspect. Um, you know, before we get into your, you know, what you've been doing the last couple of, couple of months, since I last spoke to you, but do you think maybe the troop carrier kind of fiasco has mm -hmm. rather become the story everybody talks about with air power? And then is all this fighter operations and strategic bombing going on behind that's kind of a, overlooks it a little bit. Is that, is that fair? I think it's a little bit fair. I mean, I'm not by any stretch an expert in that portion of the the air campaign. Um, but yeah, I'd say it definitely takes up a lot of space. Um, you know, the role of 82nd Airborne Division, you know, 1st uh, British Airborne Division, those are two very, you know, well-known formations. And, you know, what happened to them during this operation in many ways was, a, you know, a, a disaster, uh, even though the overall, you know, operations uh, succeeded. Um, and so that kind of makes sense to some extent. And, um, you know, I think the, in, in some ways the air force gets a bad rap, not just in terms of, you know, say the, the, the air crews aboard those, you know, uh, transport aircraft, but also, um, you know, the fact that the, you know, the Navy was often shooting at those aircraft because the Luftwaffe was overhead attacking their shipping. And, you know, I would argue that really a lot of this has to do with the Navy and, and itchy trigger fingers and, yeah. and they would come up with some better systems, you know, invasion stripes, that sort of thing to help uh, with this issue. The other issue is simply in many cases, um, maybe don't route your, you know, especially the uh, reinforcements that the 82nd Airborne sent in a couple of days later, you know, maybe don't route those right over the fleet. Uh, maybe that's not a good idea. Yeah, take so there's some lessons learned there. there yeah. for sure. uh, and that's going to be a lot of the theme today is that, you know, with allies have already learned things. North Africa has, has been a, big steep learning curve and at times things have not gone well and but yet there's sort of a there is light at the end of the tunnel there is a there is a way of moving forward husky then another test of that and then you know as you move on into italy and we'll talk about that later on but it, since we last talked we talked about you know the anniversary of the that was last year and what you been up what's been what's what's alex been up to in those, that, those last few months well it's uh you know as the executive director of the juno beach center association just a lot of really great projects on the go um, anybody planning uh, to attend the 80th anniversary of, of D-Day and the Battle of Normandy next year will get a real treat if they come to um, our museum. Um, our museum is not just a Second World War museum, in fact. It's kind of a museum of, of, to some degree, Canadian history. I mean, we at least have to give you the context of what Canada was before the war, what Canada was beyond the war, because ultimately, you know, three quarters of our visitors are not Canadian, right? So we need to give them that information. And we have a project called Faces of Canada Today um, on the go. And it should be open actually in February of next year. And then the grand opening will be just around the 80th anniversary. And that uh, exhibit is going to be a renewal of our current Contemporary Canada exhibition, you know, bringing things up to date in terms of, you know, Canada and the war in Afghanistan, uh, some Indigenous issues. Uh, and many other aspects of, of, of Canada's uh, remembrance culture as well. So really looking forward to that. Brilliant. Well, there we are. There. We've done a good plug for the Juno Beach Centre. So now we'll bring up your PowerPoint. And folks, we'll kind of do questions as we go along. But it's again, it's one of those pretty thorough presentations. But we're looking at the aspect we haven't really covered. It's come up obliquely. James Holland mentioned it, the importance of it. It's come up here and there. But, you know, this is a, a, a deeper dive today. So I'm really looking forward to this. So um, so over to you, Alex. Thanks, Woody. So you know, on that theme of, of different perspectives, um, I'm, you know, in this book that I wrote, you know, five years ago now, and in my work on Operation Husky and the Air Forces, I really come at, at it with a very different perspective from some of the now older mainstream uh, narratives. And I'll get to that in a second. But I wanted to start with a story, and it starts actually 80 years ago today. Um, on the 22nd of July, 1943, Desert Air Force Kitty Hawk fighter bombers bombed and strafed a motor convoy on a dusty road in Sicily. 
Unfortunately, instead of shooting up German and Italian lorries, they attacked Canadian vehicles. The irony was palpable. The strikes killed three Canadian soldiers who were delivering new ground recognition strips to the battalion during the advance. To make matters worse, the 54th Light Anti-Aircraft Battery RCA shot down one of the Kitty Hawks. The Canadian gunners believed they were, quote, friendly planes in hostile hands, end quote. Now, the 1st Canadian Infantry Division, of which that uh, battery was part, had just completed a fine envelopment of Leon Forte and Asoro. Uh, and if you want to learn more about that battle on this day in Canadian military history, we'll have a show on that with Mark Zelke. The twin hilltop towns uh, represented the inland hedge of the German-Italian defensive line in Sicily. Continuing to roll up Axis positions, the Canadians' next target was Ajira by way of Nisoria. And working closely with the Desert Air Force for the first time, Major General Guy Simmons, the Canadian general in charge of the division, arranged close air support for this attack. 90 light bombers were to attack Ajira and its vicinity, while over 100 fighter bombers strafed Axis supply lines between Nisoria and Ajira. As it turned out, the light bombers never arrived due to signals troubles. So in the past, historians of Operation Husky have pointed to episodes like these to confirm their thesis. They argue that the Allies cost themselves total victory. Poor cross-national and inter-armed cooperation, they say, allowed the Germans to mount a skillful withdrawal against complete Allied air and naval supremacy, whilst greatly outnumbered by Allied armies. Two of the most popular test texts on this campaign are on your screen now, Carlo Deste's Bitter Victory and Samuel W. Mitchum Jr. and Friedrich von Stauffenberg's The Battle of Sicily. And they make this uh, abundantly clear in their titles, Bitter Victory with Carl Deste, and the subtitle, How the Allies Lost Their Chance for Total Victory, in the case of the book on the right. But Sicily, I argue, was a victory which thwarted German attempts to keep Italy on side for as long as possible, and to prevent the Allies from invading the mainland in 1943. The resulting Axis withdrawal across the Strait of Messina allowed the liberation of continental Europe to begin in 1943 rather than the spring of 1944. This also forced Nazi Germany to rob Peter to pay Paul, as the thinly, thinly stretched Wehrmacht sent 20% of its strength to defend its southern flank. But where was the Air Force in all of this? Focusing on the shortcomings of the campaign means that historians, in my view, have tended to obscure the critical role the Allied Air Forces have played in a significant strategic victory. The tactical air force provided cool air support that helped drive the Axis from Sicily with heavy losses. And the strategic air force made raids on mainland Italian railway transport, making Axis resupply efforts difficult. These same raids brought pressure on the Italian state to shed fascism and change sides in the war. And in this way, the strategic mission of the Allied soldiers on the ground and the Allied uh, airmen were one in the same. So. I wanted to get into a little bit about why I wrote the book. So um, I was a master's stu student uh, just about 10 years ago, um, and I had to produce a thesis. And part of my, uh, I was very fortunate to be able to tour Sicily in 2013 during the 70th anniversary of Operation Husky. And I was studying the Air Force at the time, and many of my 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 peers on the trip or some of the you know other students on the trip were asking, you know, we were on a battlefield tour. We were following the Canadian uh, 1st Infantry Division and the American 1st Infantry Division. And they were asking me, you know, where's the Air Force in all of this? And so that's, you know, part of the problem that I uh, kind of identified is most of the campaign histories, you know, they come from an Army-centric perspective. Yeah. Every once in a while, they fly some airplanes through it. Um, obviously, the Navy's role is, 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 is there, especially in terms of the, the invasion itself. But I wanted to write a campaign history from the Air Force's perspective. And based on the evidence that I was able to assemble, I, know, I wanted to note the critical role of the Allied Air Forces in the success of Operation Husky. Whole bunch of different archives um, and, and places where I did my research. Um, I was with the Greg Center for the Study of War and Society at the University of New Brunswick, and that was where I was doing the thesis. Uh, Library and Archives Canada, the National Archives in the UK, the Air Historical Branch in the UK, and the University of East Anglia, which holds the Solly Zuckerman Archive, uh, who was one of the key operational researchers for the Air Force uh, during the Second World War. Those were some of my main uh, my main resources. Um, also, and, and this is going on today with Operation Husky 2023, 
Um, there was an effort among a number of Canadian citizens to do a march through Sicily, and that the first time they did it was in 2023, and they do it every five years to raise awareness about this campaign in Canada. That is, as you've one of the themes I think throughout the your series of shows is this idea of like the, the kind of relatively forgotten campaign compared to you know D-Day and the Battle of Normandy. So they're yeah. trying to raise that awareness. But within that, and I'll talk about this a little bit more on Brad's show next week uh, on the state in Canadian military history. You know, in Canada, we focus very much on the role of the 1st Canadian Infantry Division. We don't at all focus on the role of the RCAF, the Royal Canadian Air Force, which was also significant during this operation. So uh, some of the locations we visited in Sicily, uh, Pacino, where the, the Canadian Infantry landed uh, on, on D-Day, a uh, lovely new memorial there. I think it's moved since I took this picture, uh, but, but we started to memorialize in the last, uh, you know, 10 years in a, in a more significant way. Um, also, Ponte Drillo, you know, checking out uh, things in the U.S. sector and, uh, you know, uh, very few American monuments, at least when I visited in Sicily 10 years ago. And this is one of the few monuments and, and the Americans don't have, um, I believe, all their war dead are, are, are on the mainland. And so yeah. uh, they don't really have a cemetery in Sicily. And so this was uh, quite the interesting site where, where a number of 82nd Airborne guys, you know, held off a, a German and Italian uh, counterattack tank counterattack, panzer counterattack, uh, by capturing this kind of um, small ridge that dominated a bridge that had a number of uh, Italian defensive positions in it. Um, and that's kind of top view of the ridge, bottom view of the uh, uh, view of the road uh, leading to the ridge. And you can see, obviously, there's a lot of vegetation in terms of the, the fields and everything. Uh, but, but just to in, uh, interrupt, Edmund has said it has moved from the square to yeah. down the road. There we are. Someone watching yeah. Edmund has is, is, been there, or is most possibly even still in Sicily. I don't know, but he's been yeah. part of what the and, main organizer of the event over there, the conference. And there's several new Canadian memorials that I think are just going in this year um, and have gone in, in in the years since that I was last there. Yeah. Uh, also, the Jira Canadian War Cemetery, you know, one of the, this is a, <laughs> This doesn't really do it justice because it's in the in the middle of you know July and it's very dry, very you know a lot of dead vegetation and stuff. But Mount Etna is in the distance, kind of hard to see with a little bit of a haze there. But it's a beautiful cemetery, one of the best, you know uh, loveliest uh, Canadian military cemeteries overseas. Um, then we went to Messina, and this is really where you know that question, "Where's the Air Force?" Uh, kind of came through to me because, and we'll talk about Messina a fair bit because. This is one of the few areas where you can kind of stand there and really envision what would have been going on 80 years ago in terms of the Allied air effort to interdict the Straits, in terms of the German and Italian effort to defend the Straits and to escape uh, to the mainland. And so, just, just it's, it's interesting that Messina and the possible incomplete victory there has been probably the most talked about subject this year, this week on the series of shows. Yes. Yeah. You know, we were talking before going live about the, 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 the parallel. There are parallels and then there are differences between Sicily and, and the Normandy campaign. But it's interesting that a lot of the debate about the, the incomplete victory of Normandy is the last bit. So the closing of the Falaise Gap. And it's the same thing here in Sicily. It's the last bit is that, you know, if we're going to use soccer football analogy, you know, did, did we get that final goal in the last minute? Would have made it an, um, would have, you know, a 6 nil victory or, or, or did, you know. We ended up winning two nil, or so. and and it's you know I'll be interested in in your views later on because the navy got the yeah. blame kind of yesterday, but you know it's interesting. Yeah, it's, it is interesting, and I mean this is just a really good photo. I like it because one, you can see the full the hook of Messina Harbor there. The, the, if you look at it on a, on Google Earth or whatever, you'll see this hook um, with kind of a ferry at the same kind of terminals they would have been at you know back in 1943, the railway ferries. Um, and then you can really quick, easily see, you know, it's not that far to the mainland, you know, it's only a couple of kilometers. So uh, it's not like this is a huge distance that they have to, uh, that the Germans and Italians need to surmount to, to get their stuff away. Then I like to share a couple of maps um, before I really get into things. And, and this is a beautiful map done by Mike Bechtold, who I think has presented on your channel before, Woody, yep. uh, one, of the better Canadian, one of the better military map makers out there. And... Uh, that's the army's battle, right? You know, I've got some airfields located on this map. You can see them, you know, in, 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 in I think it's blue there. Um, but that's the army's battle. And what I want to do is to focus on the air force's battle, which the battle space is much larger and the temporal scope is much larger. The army's battle is, you know, 9, 10, July 43 to 17, August, 1943. 
And that's why the title of my book is The Allied Air Forces in the Sicilian Campaign, 14 May to 17 August 1943, because things start well before uh, the first troops uh, uh, land in Sicily. Uh, but also important to understand that the Air Force is dealing with, with a much wider theater of operations and supporting this operation. So we'll start at the Casablanca Conference. Um, of course, the plan to invade Sicily originates here. Roosevelt, Churchill, and their staffs meet to discuss the course of the war in 1943. The British put forward a strategy to remove Italy from the war and to force Italy or Germany to move forces south to replace these losses. The Americans, and I'm, I'm summarizing here, are unable to advocate for a viable alternative, and they grudgingly approve the invasion of Sicily. Now the question comes down to, okay, how are they going to do this? How are they going to knock Italy out of the war? Well, with Operation Husky, the invasion of Sicily, Italy's largest island province. If things go well, Sicily can be used as a springboard for an invasion of the mainland. Also at Casablanca, Allied commanders are appointed for the operation, including General Dwight Eisenhower as Commander-in-Chief. So we also need to talk about Mediterranean Air Command, because uh, it was formed kind of as a result of the discussions at the Casablanca conference. Um, the invasion of Western Africa, Oper Operation Torch, uh, brought a large American Air Force into a theater that the RAF had been at war in for you know, over three years. And in February of 1943, the Allies then created a joint Air Force command, and this command emphasized functionality. So you had a tactical Air Force, you know, to support the Army. You had a strategic Air Force to hit targets further afield. Um, and you had a coastal Air Force to, you know, protect the coast and attack enemy shipping. Uh, you had a transport command, that sort of thing. It also followed the principle that at the higher levels of command, British commanders would have American deputies and American commanders would have British deputies. So they started kind of that tradition here. Air Chief Marshal Sir Arthur Tenner, who, Tedder, who's got the pipe in his mouth in this photo, uh, takes command of all Allied Air Forces in the Mediterranean as well, centralizing them under one command. Uh, the other men in the slide, we have Air uh, Marshal Sir Arthur Cunningham on the uh, on the left with his hands in his pockets. You have um, uh, I think he was Lieutenant General at the time, uh, Tui Spatz, with the, the pipe in his hand there. And on the right, you actually have um, uh, Lawrence Cuter, who was, um, uh, I'm trying to remember now, yeah, he was Conningham's deputy for the Tunisian campaign. He actually right. moves on to a different position after the Tunisian campaign, but I talk about him a little bit in my book anyway. Um, and then I think I have, we have um, quite famous uh, Major General at the time, uh, Jimmy Doolittle. Uh, who's in charge of the strategic air forces. He just came down uh, to, to do that. Eventually, he'd go on to, to, to lead the 8th uh, U.S. Army Air Forces in the U.K. And then we have Sir Hugh Pugh Lloyd, air, 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 I think it's Air Vice Marshal at this time, uh, Lloyd. And he was the former commander of Malta before Sir Keith Park got involved. And I'll talk about Park in a second. Um, but he basically is in charge of the coastal air forces. And so each of these men would have a deputy who is, if he's British, he'd have American deputy and vice versa. Now, Tedder, who's in overall command, basically has a certain doctrine that he and his air forces operate with. And it's, there's a priority sequence here. So the air force's first job is to secure air superiority over the battle space. And this primarily involves targeted strikes on German and Italian airfields, although attrition does occur in other ways. Priority number two is interdiction, to attack enemy lines of communication, mainly in the form of ports and railway facilities. The aim is to limit the enemy's means of supply and reinforcement, as well as to impose losses on the enemy before they even reach the battlefield. Now, the third priority, and this certainly bugs the army, is to provide the army with close air support, either by attacking targets agreed upon in advance, or by responding to army requests as the battle develops. These ideas had been tested in the Western desert, desert, especially under Canadian Raymond Collishaw and then later under Sir Arthur Conningham. And with Sicily, the air forces are putting proven doctrine to work, but there's still some disagreement over whether close air support should be in priority three. So on the 13th of May, 1943, Axis forces in North, North Africa capitulate and the allies enter Tunis. Axis casualties amount to 70,000 killed and wounded, with 230,000 taken prisoner. And since the landings in northwest Africa, the Luftwaffe alone had lost 2,400 aircraft in the Mediterranean, a huge number. 
A big part of this, and this is what's illustrated uh, in part on the screen, was Operation Flak, with Flak which was planned uh, by Brigadier General Lawrence Cuter to intercept Luftwaffe transports. On Palm Sunday, 1943, he recorded the following observations. Quote, I watched the fight over Tunis on our radar scope and heard it through my headset. All was excitement. All conversations were in the clear. Code names of units and targets were forgotten. Colloquialisms and profanities over the air identified New Zealand, Australian, English, and American pilots as they demanded room in the bloody airspace to get in on the kill. From my electronic view, the scene resembled the feeding frenzy of our Atlantic coast blue fish. By dark, the Tunis Harbor was littered with some floating air cargo, ditched aircraft, and small rescue boats. On Palm Sunday, our claims totaled over 100 transports and 10 fighters. In total, Operation Flax destroyed 432 aircraft, of which 400 were transports, at the cost of just 35 fighters. The Mediterranean was quickly turning into Hitler's ulcer as he tried to wage a global war on three fronts. So to provide cover for the landings, the Allies needed airfields close to Sicily. Malta provided a great base for fighters covering the Anglo-Canadian landings in the southeast, but the Americans further west needed more support. There was an Italian air base on the island of Pantelleria, and the Allied bomber forces set about bombing it into submission. Now the key to this bombing effort was aerial photo reconnaissance. Um, and this allowed Solly Zuckerman, Tedder's scientific advisor, to adjust the bombing. Wind, Wing Commander Adrian Warburton, pictured on the right here, um, led the PR aircraft, photo reconnaissance aircraft, on Malta, and he conducted many of these sorties in person. And to get his photos, he flew at 200 feet in range of the island's coastal defenses. And one of his pilots later quipped that, quote, Warby was the only pilot I ever heard of who was fired on by anti-aircraft guns from above. Pantelleria is really interesting as well because in some ways the American Air Forces, in particular um, Jimmy Doolittle, they want to use it as an experiment to show what the Allied Air Forces, what the American Air Force in particular can do. And, and in some ways they try to use it as an argument that the Air Force can kind of go it alone and do it its own thing. Um, you know, they argue that, well, you know, the Italians basically surrendered without a fight. You know, yes, there was a British infantry division that landed, but there was really no resistance. I think Churchill writes something about, like, someone got bitten by a mule and that was it. <laughs> and so, you know, they try to use it as that, but it's very much a, um, it's, it's like a laboratory experiment that has no relation to, you know, conditions outside of that lab almost, I would, I would probably say. Still, though, Solly Zuckerman, who did a lot of, um, analysis on, on the bombings uh, uh, indicated that um, it was very interesting because it was the coastal defenses in particular they were targeting. And it wasn't that they were able to destroy the coastal defenses, but what they were able to do um, was to, you know, wreck their communications, uh, smash vision slit, you know, smash equipment, that sort of thing, and make it a real tough go for the defenders on the island. It was very difficult for the defenders to move water around, for instance. And that in part led to their decreased morale and, and, and decision to, 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 to not, you know, put up a real fight at the end. So it, there's some interesting tidbits from that uh, in terms of the later operations, you know, potentially even the use of heavy bombers to attack, you know, coastal defense mm -hmm. and, and defenses in Normandy, for instance. So Malta strikes back. Air headquarters Malta, this is where kind of the the dividends of um, holding on to Malta in you know 1942 in particular uh, really kind of pay out because um, Air Headquarters Malta was an essential base for Allied fighters and bomber air, or light bomber aircraft uh, during uh, Operation Husky. Before the Allies could establish their tactical air headquarters ashore, uh, Sir Keith Park, the hero of the Battle of Britain, uh, uh, famous for his command of Number 11 Group during that uh, particular uh, battle. Uh, and he was commander of Air HQ Malta from the summer of 1942. He took direct charge of air support for the landings in the first you know, week or so uh, and, and leading up to that. Uh, I'll get to, I'll get to uh, him in a second there. So the island of Malta, and uh, James Holland talked about this in his talk, was suddenly swarming with spitfires of the Desert Air Force. And the South African official history describes the this, this scene, quote, Aircraft were dispersed beside the roads leading to the airfields and even in the villages from which they had to taxi amid clouds of dust to reach the runway for takeoff, end quote. One of the newly arrived pilots was flying officer George Noel Keith of Tabor, Alberta. 
he was a veteran of the heavy air fighting over Dieppe in August of 1942, and he found himself with 72 Squadron RAF flying Spitfires with the Desert Air Force. And in North Africa, he had been credited with two and a half Measure Smith BF 109s destroyed. On the 18th of June 1943, his squadron was on patrol over southern Sicily when he shot down a 50 kill German ace named Major Gerhard Mikulski, and that brought his score to 3.5 enemy aircraft destroyed. We'll get back to his story uh, a little later. Just before we um, start yeah. with our axis preparations, do you want to do a little round of questions? Because a few have come in, I think, and you may be addressing If you're addressing them later, just say, I'm addressing it later, Woody, but just so you don't Absolutely. build up. And we'll do that. So um, Ian Carr is saying, did IFF notification provide a recognizable signal for all allied aircraft to all allied Ooh. ships? If that's coming up, you can do it. But if not, we can address it. Uh, it's not coming up. I actually, I actually don't have a good answer to that, to be honest. Uh, I'd have to do a little bit of digging on that um, for sure. We like it when, um, a, think, when a viewer stamps a history. And that's yeah, I mean, there. I think, I think generally speaking, they did have um, good, like they had IIFF, but I'm not sure how well uh, it worked in terms of all allied ships and everything like that. I think there was a good system in terms of like the night fighter system and the, defense, the air defense system that would be set up later. Uh, but I'm not sure in the initial stages of the campaign if it was, okay. if it was working well. And connected to that, um, Peter O'Connell is saying, did Allied Air and Ground Forces have mm -hmm. dedicated radio frequencies for communication at that time? Um, I guess my question, would, what do you mean by dedicated? I mean, they're on separate frequencies for sure. I don't know. Um, there, there are, we're still, we're not at the stage yet. It's only very late in the campaign where the ground is really able to talk to the air directly. Right. Uh, that only happens very late in the campaign, not early in the campaign at all. Um, we're not at the point yet where we're doing, you know, Rover Davids, Rover Joes. We're not at the point where we're doing, um, you know, there's a, a cab rank or anything like that. Yeah. We're, we're not there yet. Yeah. Okay. Three more, then I'll let you hand it back to you. So David, David O'Keefe, Mr. O'Keefe himself, it goes back to um to Tedder. So where are we at this point when it comes to the history of dysfunction between Montgomery <laughs> and Tedder? I don't think we're quite there yet. I think there's some definitely in terms of the planning that went on, and James explained this quite well in his talk. Uh, part of the big thing was the debate between going after ports and going after airfields. And Tedder was obviously on the side of we need to go after airfields. Um, and Montgomery ultimately was kind of on side with that to some extent because he wanted a concentration of force in the, in the, in the south uh, west of the island. Um, so there's a little bit of animosity over that and just going back and forth. But honestly, I don't think it becomes uh, too big of a problem at this point. Um, I seem to remember rereading in my book that uh, after the actual landings, a couple of days in, Monty sends a very nice message to Tedder. It's either Tedder or Conningham. I can't remember which of a Cottingham's Tedder's guy, essentially, um, saying, you know, you guys have won the air battle. Well done. You know, so we're not at the point where that animosity is. It's there. It's under the surface, but it's not what it will be in Normandy. OK, thank you. Another one. This may be coming up later. Gary August. What level of importance does Alex attach to the construction of the pipeline supply between Jayla and Ooh. Comiso? Hmm. That's a good one. It's a bit of a stumping one for me as well. Um, Certainly, it's very important to get those um, advanced airfields set up, um, and, and Camiso is one of those that is that falls, you know, relatively quickly, and the you know Americans get in get in order and start moving their forces in. So it's it's quite important. I don't know enough about how that airfield was used longer term, because where, where it's positioned, it's not. There are more airfields that the Allies would later capture around Catania and the Catania Plain yep. that would be more useful for um you know future operations potentially than camiso but i you know i'd have to look more into uh, what 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 further use camiso had after the sicilian campaign ended okay thank you and then the final one it's about kind of intelligence generally but jeff is asking to what extent did code breaking affect the planning of operations so i mean just are, ultra basically yeah you guys are really stumping me on some of this stuff i think um i think it uh i mean certainly had something to do with the um deception operations and everything that was going on, you know, it allowed the allies to kind of have somewhat of an understanding of whether or not they're, um, because the deception operations, of course, you know, we're talking about Operation Mincemeat, but there's a broader context to that. And the Air Force is part of that in terms of, you know, bombing Sardinia and bombing other locations uh, to try to keep the enemy guessing, though kind of by the end of it, everybody kind of figures out it's going to be Sicily. So I think it probably allowed them to adjust things that way. Um, it certainly allowed them to, 
Yeah, David gets that knows this. Yeah, let, let, let's 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 turn over to David. We've yeah. got the master now. Generally speaking, code breaking sets the backbeat to the intelligence planning, yeah. very similar to where, the way the drummer keeps the beat in a band. You build up from there. And I think I think in some cases, I, I'm pretty sure there was one case later in August where the um, the Americans dispatch a number of their bombers to actually hit a German airfield in southern France. And I think part of the reason they did that was because they knew that from intelligence. Right. Um, and that sort of thing. Uh, but, uh, you know, so there were opportunities taken definitely based on uh, some of that intelligence. Okay. Well, we've done a round of questions. You can breathe easy a bit and we'll get back to your presentation. <laughs> so act preparations, um, after the collapse in North Africa, the Germans saw the three islands, uh, kind of Sardinia, Sicily, and Crete as the advanced defense line of Southern Europe. And one Luftwaffe order read quote, should the enemy succeed in gaining a foothold in one of these islands, he will have achieved a penetration into Fortress Europe, which would signify a grave threat to the defense of the mainland. Every last man and weapon must be rallied to prevent this from happening, end quote. And so, unable to rapidly move ground forces into the theater, and the Germans, of course, did do that and were doing that, the Luftwaffe, which can move a little bit faster, became a critical part of the German plan to defend Sicily. The Germans, as you can see on my screen there, brought in experts to command the Luftwaffe in the region. You, know, you had Field Marshal Wolfram von Richthofen, who commanded Luftflotte II. Uh, they brought back uh, kind of their day fighter expert, Adolf Gallen, from, you know, he was kind of leading things uh, to a great extent on the Western Front against the uh, Allied Air Forces at the time. Brought him in to try to set up a system for defending against um, American bombers in particular, you know, fortresses, the B-17s, uh, B-24s to some extent attacking during daylight. They also brought in General Joseph Cam Huber, who was responsible for the, the Cam Huber uh, line and system of night fighter defenses. And they wanted to bring him in to set up um, a night fighter defense system because the Italians really didn't have anything like it. They didn't really have um, good air defense systems uh, like the Germans you know, had at this point in the war, like the British had even earlier in the war. So they were really trying to, they brought in their, their best guys to try to um, help with this. They also committed 40% of single engine fighter construction uh, during this time to reinforce the units that had escaped Tunisia and to equip the new units they were sending south. So the, the Luftwaffe, the Germans are making a big investment in the Air Force in this theater uh, to help them hold uh, in, this, in the central Mediterranean. What I would argue is this also presents the Allied Air Forces with an excellent opportunity to destroy German aircraft on more favorable terms. Um, we're not at the point where there's you know, long range fighter escorts from the UK or anything like that. You know, in some raids, the Americans are losing, you know, dozens, if not, you know, maybe 50 bombers in a raid up there. You know, it, it's taking them a month to lose that sort of number, you know, here here in the Mediterranean. And they are experimenting with, um, because some of the, the distances aren't quite as far as going all the way from the UK quite to, you know, central or, or eastern Germany. Um, they're also experimenting with, you know, P-38s as long-range escort fighters as well. And so there's there's, there's that aspect happening. The Blitz on Sicily, and uh, there's those, there's the numbers. Two, two newly formed FW-190 fighter bomber wings also sent. So again, in, in this theater, they're not really using the, the, the 190, the Falk Wolf, as a fighter. They're used as a strict fighter. They're using it as a fighter bomber uh, in this instance. So the Blitz on Sicily began in early July, and this is really where, you know, the, the, they had been bombing Sardinia before this, and there was some indication, oh, maybe it's going to be Sardinia, but then the Allies in early July really start to focus on Sicily, and it becomes fairly obvious. This actually forced the German and Italian bomber forces to remove themselves to the mainland, and that further reduced their operational efficiencies, because the turnaround times were longer, and that sort of thing. But it did allow them to preserve uh, those forces uh, for much longer than they otherwise would have. Despite reinforcements received from Germany, the German fighter strength uh, during the first kind of week of July 1943 actually dropped by 80 aircraft in the theater. Colonel Christ, one of the Luftwaffe's chiefs of staff in the theater, later wrote, quote, in the last few weeks before the landing, all the aerodromes, operational airfields, and landing grounds on Sicily were so destroyed in continuous attacks by mass forces that it was only possible to get this or that airfield in running order uh, again, for a short time, and mainly by mobilizing all available forces, including those of the German and Italian armies. So uh, they're having a lot of difficulty. I always kind of look at this kind of period um, uh, and, and the early part of the uh, Sicilian campaign in terms of the ground action 
Um, the Germans and Italians are almost fighting kind of a guerrilla air war. They're trying to move their aircraft from airfield to airfield, trying not to get caught on the ground. You know, they do have an air defense system with radar set up, so that helps them do that a little bit. Uh, but they're really getting, you know, if they get unlucky, they're really getting smoked at their bases. And then when they get into the air, they're they're highly outnumbered in most cases. And they, the Germans are trying to get through to the, they want to really shoot down the B-17s. They want to get, you know, take out, you know, 10 crewmen at a time, that sort of thing. And they're not having a lot of success in that. So some of the, uh, you know, uh, numbers uh, for Operation Husky, at least at the time of uh, kind of the 9th, 10th July, uh, 1943, this is what the Allies had available. Um, you know, you had about 1,500, 1500 single engine fighters, you know, 400 twin engine fighters, 13, 1400 bombers, some coastal aircraft, some army cooperation aircraft, uh, 500 transports, they had spe specific aircraft for reconnaissance. Um, they also had, you know, 500 gliders that are excluded from that transport number. So about 4,400 aircraft, um, excluding uh, gliders, and the serviceability rates tended between kind of 70 and 85 percent. That sort of that sort of level. That's what the Allies had, at least on the eve of the operation. The Axis Air Forces, and this is combat aircraft only, so I'm not including transport aircraft or numbers or that sort of thing. You know. Their serviceability rates are, you know, significantly lower, especially as a result of what I've just been talking about. But they they still have a sizable number of aircraft in the theater. Both the Regia Aeronautica and the Luftwaffe, you know, have you know between them, you know, over 800 serviceable aircraft and 1,600 uh, total strength. So not a small number by any means. Uh, certainly the Allies outnumber them, uh, but it's a big theater and there's a lot of different uh, things for Allied aircraft in particular to do since they're you know, taking the initiative and, and starting the operation. And this is only a snapshot in time. Like these numbers, of course, would have changed day by day, maybe hour by hour, right? Depending on what was going on uh, and everything like that. Force protection was an important role for the Allied Air Forces in the early phases in particular. Um, you know, a whole bunch of different convoys coming from different places, convoys coming from Egypt, convoys coming from, um, you know, Tunisia, convoys coming from the UK. Uh, I think there's even you know, convoys coming from the U.S. as well. So a lot of different moving parts here. And, you know, the coastal air forces, as well as um, the, the fighters in Malta in particular, you know, were responsible for protecting uh, uh, these uh, these convoys. Uh, the assembly point was very much, as you can see, kind of everything's assembling right around Malta there. And to, to Malta's credit, you know, there were no air attacks against uh, any of these convoys really um, leading up to the kind of 9th of July, the, the night of when the landings kind of start to be initiated. A um, uh, little bit, maybe, you know, the, the Coastal Air Force is also having to defend against enemy submarines. And so I think Mark Zilke talked a little bit about how, you know, three Canadian uh, ships were, yeah. were sunk on their way here. And so, you know, uh, I'm not sure the specifics of that. I don't know if there was a, a failure or anything on the part of the Air Force, but, you know, it's not always easy to to, to track submarines and that sort of thing. And, and so, you know, obviously uh, that one, you know, got through and did some great damage, but, um, you know, for the most part, this is a very successful uh, phase of the operation. Just a quick question from David O'Keefe yeah. for, for you. Do you know if they continue to implement the air intelligence control that they had implemented very quickly at Dieppe? <clears throat> did they use that in system? And if so, what effect? He's got Dieppe in there for you, Alex. Yeah. So, you know, you two can go off on a Dieppe rabbit hole now. Honestly, I don't know. I don't know if they, you know, air intelligence isn't something I focused on for this. Um, so I'm not quite sure um, what they, you know, if they, if they adapted anything from, from Dieppe. It is a very different set of commanders here, and they developed kind of their own air intelligence systems, you know, in the Western desert and, and elsewhere. So they might have kind of, they might have had their, their, their kind of own ways of thinking and doing things. Uh, but I'm sure there must be some parallels in terms of the development. I just don't know enough about it. Sorry, David. Okay, no problem. Um, he, he he likes putting tough questions in because he he's does. David O'Keefe, isn't he? Well, and he, he he knows the intel stuff so well. So, um, where was I here? So, force protection also extends obviously into the landings themselves. Um, and generally speaking, uh, the U.S. Navy is fairly critical of the air cover they received uh, during the initial landings. Um, they lost, uh, you know, several of their cruiser-based ba uh, spotter aircraft, for instance, um, to, to German fighters and, and Italian fighters uh, as they were kind of trying to observe inland to, you know, catch those approaching counterattacks, especially at uh, uh, at, at Jela. Um, 
I've included this photo um, of a P38 though, because uh, it's not a photo, I should say, it's a, it's a piece of artwork done by um, an American uh, soldier at the time, uh, soldier airman at the time. Uh, but uh, basically the reason I included this is because even though that's a the photo reconnaissance version of the P38, one of the complaints that the, um, the American Admiral, uh, uh, I think his name was uh, Hewitt, who was in charge uh, of the American landings, uh, was he wished that they had more like control over the fighters that were overhead uh, from the ships. And he also wished that they had actually had P-38s um, involved uh, more directly, um, uh, you know, as long range aircraft that could spend more time over the target. But the, the irony of that is, is actually the Allied air plan um, had these aircraft, you know, some of them were doing escort missions, you know, as the bombers were attacking enemy airfields and that sort of thing, which was absolutely the right thing to be doing. The other thing the P-38s are doing is they're doing interdiction missions to shoot up, you know, German convoys and things and Italian convoys in land. And at times, those pickets essentially became pickets for the enemy air forces. And so in some cases, the enemy air forces aren't even getting through to the beaches because those P-38s, which are a little bit further inland, just not necessarily visible uh, to the fleet offshore, uh, they're actually doing their, their work. And I have a whole section of a, a chapter dedicated to dealing with this uh, because there's a lot of criticism that's labeled at the Allied Air Forces for the, the, the supposed lack of air cover that they received during, uh, especially during the American uh, landings. The Montgomery, as I said earlier, is very happy with the British landings and, and that goes you know, relatively well and there's, there's fewer issues. The Germans certainly sink a number of vessels, nothing like what anybody what he had feared. You know, I think they sunk maybe less than, than a dozen. You know, so it's not a not a tiny number, but also not a not a huge number. And certainly those you know had consequences in terms of as we were discussing earlier, you know, the, the itchy trigger fingers of the Navy and that sort of thing. And um, and there were a lot of issues in terms of uh, um, uh, air air control. They were supposed to be certain. Uh, kind of rules of engagement for those gunners that they didn't necessarily always follow as well. Um, and this actually really started to tick off uh, some of the uh, the airmen because they were doing their best. You know, they were staying at above like 10,000 feet. You're not supposed to fire at anything. The, the the Navy wasn't supposed to fire at anything that was a single engine aircraft that wasn't attacking them at all. And they were doing it anyway. And so in many cases, the, you know, Allied aircraft were frustrated because they had to, you know, bugger off instead of being shot at. And that left openings for the Germans. Um, Warburton, who I talked about earlier, he was doing some photo reconnaissance in the area. He got shot at. He was so ticked off. He actually went back to Malta, grabbed a bunch of his uh, wing commander and squadron leader buddies, and they went out and spit fires and just went trolling for German and Italian fighters and, and got into, got into the, they, 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 you know, they, they shot up some German aircraft, Italian aircraft, and then they came back and got in, a, got a bit of flack for that because it was like, why are you taking this big risk? You know, all you, you know, pretty essential tactical leaders, you know, you could all have all been killed at once, that sort of thing. So there's a lot of animosity, I guess, that, that comes up over this, um, which I get to, get to in, in, a, in a greater extent in my book. But um, at the end of the day, what I argue is there's, there's, there's certainly criticism of, most of the criticism is around the fact that the, um, the Air Force is defending the Americans' landings hardly engage anything on July 10th. But on July 11th, which is the key day of the counterattack, they're doing most of the engagements and they are actually engaging the enemy. And if you look at Hewitt's own reports and he's saying, you know, X number of um, there were X number of contacts plotted, you know, trying to attack us, X number, you know, actually managed to get through to attack us. But he says himself that the, the, the majority of those were actually seen off by Allied aircraft. So. No, they can't be perfect. They're not always going to be perfect. They're not always going to be there at the right time in the right place to, you know, to, to ward off those attacks. But for the most part, they are successful in spite of some of the challenges imposed by their own Navy, um, you know, especially the, the friendly fire and that sort of thing. So, you know, that's that's something I cover in detail in, in my book. On the um, on the uh, the British side of the landings, uh, our friend uh, George Noel O'Keefe is flying cover over there with his squadron. And uh, he shoots down several aircraft during this period, uh, actually becoming an ace. Uh, he destroys two aircraft, an Italian fighter and a German bomber on the second day of the invasion. And that puts him to five uh, or over five. And over the next few days, he shoots down at least three more and he's recommended for a distinguished flying cross. So uh, this is just one example. There's plenty of air combat going on uh, uh, at this time. Uh, you know, plenty of aces are being made. In general, what I will say, 
is the Germans and Italians are very active for the first few days after the invasion and during the daytime. And then when they're getting some pretty significant losses, they change over to nighttime um, and start attacking the Allied uh, assembled ships and, and, and the ports that they started to capture um, at night. And the Allies respond. They have night fighters uh, in place in them for the most part. And those night fighters rack up some pretty incredible kill counts as well. Um, now, of course, you know, that's not, you know, it's, it's the whole issue about, you know, air to air confirmed kills. It's you know, difficult to know 100 percent unless you're comparing records and all that stuff. Um, but the, it's still pretty impressive. There's a I can't remember which day it is. There's one um, mosquito pilot and his um, his observer who shoot down in a very short period, five German and Italian bombers, uh, you know, like the, the ace in a day sort of thing. So this is the, the air battle is is fairly intense um, for the first week after the the, uh, the landings. And, and it, the intensity in the day kind of dies down and then, and then increases at night as the, as the campaign goes on. The result of this is the Axis Air Forces. And this is, again, the uh, you know, James Holland talked about this and the planning and where they decided to land and why they decided to land there, you know, especially because of the airfields. This forces the Germans and the Italians to abandon Sicily from an airfield perspective. Like, there's just no way that they can sustain things because they're going to lose most of those airfields or they're going to be very quickly come under artillery fire and that sort of thing. So very quickly, um, you know, everything is being moved uh, to the mainland. Um, the Luftwaffe's evacuation itself is complete by the 17th of July. And the Axis Air Forces leave behind over a thousand aircraft in varying states of damage. And some of these were actually rapidly made flyable and used by arriving Royal Air Force and U.S. Army Air Force crews. Now, there's a point made about how, well, you know, these are in some ways, these are kind of airplane graveyards that have piled up a little bit since, you know, uh, you know, the, the, the siege of Malta. And that's true to some extent. But there's still a lot of aircraft that, you know, with a little bit of work or even with hardly any work at all. You know, could have been you know flown out uh, and that sort of thing, but just because they were missing a spare part or because they were just you know damaged in such a way that they couldn't be flown out that they were just abandoned and and put to the torch in some cases and in other cases not put to the torch at all and the, the Allied air crews you know had their way with them. So uh, this is what is this is what is being left behind. Uh, and then the it's tactical quick, air force. Another, another quick yeah, question from David O'Keefe because he keeps asking hey. questions. How would you rate the Italian Air Force specifically at this particular point? We always tend to make jokes about their army in North Africa, but I've always heard the opposite about their uh, their Air Force. And you know, I, I think I think this a little bit because there's there's engines and, and spares yeah. and that kind of issue. But yeah, I mean they have some really good aircraft, some really good fighter aircraft, especially at this stage in the war. They have some of the best you know fighter aircraft you know of the Second World War. They also have some very good pilots, and a lot of their pilots with experience from even before the war, you know, as like aerial um, racers and stuff like that. What I would say, I guess, about the Italians and the Germans in particular is, you know, we 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 seem to we sit here and complain a lot about how the Americans and the British didn't get along all the time. Well, these two, you know, the two Axis air forces is like like they hardly work together at all. The Germans would just come in and impose whatever they wanted. You know, there was very little coordination. You don't really have too many instances of German aircraft escorting Italian aircraft or vice versa. You know, the Italian Air Force is, you know, it's it's certainly, you know, had a long war and and and, and lost a lot of stuff in, in, in North Africa and that sort of thing. Up until this point, you know, they actually had still had a number of um, high profile like fighter aces. I can't remember their names, but a couple of them are killed. Uh, just on the eve of Operation Husky. So some of those kind of famous aces are starting to really be killed at this point. Um, so they're they're okay. You know, it's 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 not something we should slough off and just focus on the German numbers and say, oh, the Luftwaffe is all that matters. No, I don't think that's the case. The Italian Air Force. And actually, one thing I should say is around this time, a couple of days after the, the landings, I, I think the evidence is it's not 100% sure if it was a German or an Italian aircraft that did it, but it's, I think it was an Italian aircraft that hit uh, one of the, uh, I can't remember which carrier it is, it's either indomitable or formidable, I can't remember which one, gets hit by a torpedo uh, when it's yeah. out doing doing the screening. And uh, basically the aircraft gets through the screen because it, uh, I guess the flight control guys think it's a, an albacore coming back because uh, that was the schedule that was coming back at that time. And it got through and, and it holed the carrier. The carrier was saved and eventually had to go to the U.S. for repairs. But, you know, the Italians are still capable of doing damage. Um, yeah. You know, and I'm, glad, I'm glad you reiterated what other historians have said these two weeks. Well, it, it came up in the Torch series. Is that Torch, I would argue, 
is the real test of allied leadership and friction. You know, Roosevelt and Churchill's different ideas about North Africa. And it, it, and it is a test. It is a test of people out there and various people get involved and get grumpy about things and Mark Clark and others in North Africa. But I would say by Sicily, a lot of those tensions are ironed out. I mean, the very high level. I mean, there's still the Montgomery and Patton thing down. And I think the Italians, as as Julio said uh, last week, they, they, they've they absolutely peaked. It's, so everything is on a rapidly declining disagreement now. And, Hit, and Hitler and Mussolini, their relationship couldn't be any yeah. worse at this point. The, the, the Italian within Italy, between the air, their air force, their navy, their, it couldn't be any worse. So everything is, the, the, the two, the two, the Axis and the Allies are are, are hitting up, you know, opposite direct moving, direction moving arrows on the graphs. And it's, you know, yeah. and uh, things are in a sense keep on getting better the allies and they kind of keep on getting worse for the axis yeah and i think one of the things that you could probably be critical of the italians for and 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 perhaps the germans are very critical of them for this is they don't have a very good air defense network and yeah. they don't have a very good system to control their airfields and to keep things moving and everything like that so the germans are very frustrated by this um and i'll get to that in a second but you know the 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 nice thing about the Germans and Italians leaving and the fact that the plan had the Allies capturing these airfields early on is that the Allied air forces can move in and you've then solved a significant amount of your troubles in terms of range, right? Because now you can yeah. move the aircraft from Pantelleria and from Malta, the, the single engine fighters first, you know, it's kind of a domino effect. Single engine fighters come first, the day fighters come first, then they are eventually followed into Malta by, you know, tactical bombers and stuff like that, which allows some of these forces to actually have the proper range to do the full job that they're going to need to be doing because some of the tactical bomber force was actually based back in um, uh, North Africa and in Tunisia and even Libya and in some cases you know they're not able to fully operate at their best you know peak capability because of those those ranges but now that's starting to change as well so um, that's a good point to ask Jeff's question. Then I'll shut up and let you talk. Because Jeff is asking, how many sorties per day did the Allies run during the initial phase before moving to the Sicilian bases, or did you cover that already? Says Jeff. I mean, I, I don't have the overall numbers, but I'm pretty sure, in terms of the Malta um, Spitfires, these are the groups that may be flying multiple missions a day. I mean, the bombers don't tend to fly more than one or two missions a day at that. Um, but the uh, the 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 um, single engine fighters in particular, they're flying, you know, three or four sorties a day. And I think it gets up there for some to like, you know, four and five and maybe even six in some cases. Right. They're, they're, it's a pretty high intensity of operations to try to keep those. That there's basically schedule set in terms of covering the landings and making sure they're there cover at various stages. And so they're doing their best to do that. They also want to maintain that coverage at significant strength, at squadron strength, 12 aircraft. Um, and so to do that, it requires a lot of a lot of pilots flying multiple sorties per day and that sort of thing. So it, it does vary depending on the squadron, depending on the unit. But they're 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 up there in the early phases, and they start coming back down to like you know one or two per day um, uh, later on per squadron. So okay, thanks. Back to you. No problem. So now we're starting to get into the strategic implications of all of this. Um, on the 19th of July, 1943, Mussolini and Hitler meet in northern Italy at uh, Feltri. And Mussolini is coming with instructions. He's been told, like, he's got it. He's not like the dictator Hitler is, right? He gets some instructions from the king and, and from the, the, the fascist party and everything like that. And he's basically told, you need to get Italy out of its commitments to Germany. But at the time, he's drowned out by an irate Hitler who complains about the losses his Air Force is experiencing. And, in particular, he's complaining about the losses on the ground that are happening, and he's blaming the Italian lack of organization on the ground for that. Um, I think at one point he says something like, you know, like 320 or something aircraft destroyed on the ground in the last couple of weeks, right? So these are significant numbers. Um, the very same day, the Allies target Rome. They attack aerodromes, uh, various uh, military industries in the area, and mar the marshalling yards at the center of, of the city. And the aim of this, and Tedder is very clear about this, this is what he wanted to do, you know, he talked about this in a couple of days after, or a day or two after uh, the landings are successful. He says, depending on the success of the landings and how things are going, I'm gonna target, you know, we wanna, we wanna really bring the fight to, you know, the center of the, the fascist state here. And the idea is to influence the Italian government to sue for peace, and also, as well, to paralyze the Italian railway system 
linking central Italy with southern Italy to hopefully slow down or impact the uh, Italian or German potential reinforcements coming to the aid of the, the garrison in Sicily. The Allies are largely successful on both counts, although they kill an estimated one to two thousand uh, Rome, Roman civilians uh, in the process. As you can see, there's a marshalling yard in this photo, but it's right at the center of the city. There's a big basilica whose name escapes me right now, right next to it, and it gets you know hit pretty bad as well. The the um, American and British crews, American cr crews in particular, are well briefed. For this operation, they're told to avoid the Vatican at all costs, that sort of thing. But of course, you know, the technology they have at the time, um, you know, it's, it's carpet bombing, right? So you, you try to hit a marshalling yard, it's a good target for that sort of, you know, thing. But there's going to be creep back, there's going to be misses, and, and there are, and, uh, you know, there's significant loss of civilian life in the process. So with the trains no longer running on time, what Mussolini was supposedly known for, uh, Mussolini is finished. Um, King Victor Emmanuel III, who's in the center photo there, deposes Mussolini on the 25th of July, 1943, replacing him with another not so nice person, Marshal Pietro Baldolio, who's on the right uh, of the uh, three images. And that new government's mandate is to seek an armistice with the Allies, and of course, to try to do it in secret so that the Germans don't, you know, um, you know, hit them with a whole bunch of reprisals. For their part, the Germans want to hold on to Sicily as long as possible to buy time for their forces to take over Italy, because they're not stupid. They figure, they figure once Mussolini is done here, the Italians are going to try to change sides or do something. Um, and so they want to hold Sicily as long as possible, because as long as that hell holds, they figure Italy won't be able to leave the war. Um, and so until the armistice can occur, the Allied Air Forces must continue to support the Army, and they provide both on-call air support, they conduct armed reconnaissance behind the lines, uh, fire bombers strike German and Italian convoys when they're forced to move along major roads during the day to resupply and shore up defenses. There's a lot of kind of hammer and anvil going on here where the Army is attacking in a certain place. The Germans, you know, they realize this and they're like, well, we prefer to move at night, but if they don't have a choice, they, can, they move during the day, and then the Allied Air Forces can pounce. But close air support is a risky business, as the enemy, Germans in particular, have plenty of anti-aircraft artillery. So on August uh, 4th, 1943, uh, our friend Noel Swagger is flying a mission supporting uh, escorting bombers to their target in support of the army. The bombers complete their mission, and then the Spitfires are released to attack targets of opportunity. And during this, uh, his Spitfire is hit by flak during a strafing run. Unable to maintain heights, Noel bails out. Uh, managed to, to do so over the sea. There's a really good air sea rescue system in place uh, for the Allied Air Forces, but he hits his leg on the aircraft's tailplane. He is picked up by an air sea rescue walrus aircraft. He's rushed to a military hospital in Sicily uh, where he dies of his wounds. And so the photo on the right is back in. Tabor, Alberta in 1944, and his parents are being presented with his distinguished flying cross. So just one of the many Canadian airmen killed during this uh, campaign. I think we're going to start to get into the stuff that people are really interested in, um, in yeah. terms of uh, what Sicily, the legacy, I guess, of Operation Husky, if you will. Um, the literature on Operation Husky, perhaps with the except, exception of you know Jane Holland's new book, um, would tell you that the big story is the German army's escape to the mainland. My research suggests that this emphasis is overblown, and we do have to keep in mind that there was a German propaganda effort to sell Sicily as a Dunkirk-like victory at a time when Germany was reeling from one, the pending loss of a major ally, two, failure at first, Three, the firestorm in Hamburg, which killed 37,000 German citizens. Now, I have got the numbers of the anti-aircraft guns in the straits on the screen. You've got 390 anti-aircraft guns of various calibers. 240 or so of these are on land, and 150 of these are aboard vessels like the Siebel Ferry um, that is in this photo here. And you can see this is not one of the ferries from Operation Lair Gang, but there's a 20-millimeter uh, anti-aircraft gun quad mounted anti-aircraft gun um, on the back of that there. Um, this concentration of anti-aircraft fire was pretty significant and made a big difference. And I'm going to show you why in a second. What I will also say 
is that the intake aircraft guns in the Strait, they actually made attacks on the relatively small, you can see how small these ferries are, um, German and Italian coastal vessels, very inaccurate. And ultimately, the Allied Air Forces also did not unleash their full potential. Um, the Navy, for its part, was uncomfortable with providing a physical barrier as long as the enemy's coastal defenses remained in place as well. So really, if you were going to do this, you would have needed a coordinated air and sea effort, perhaps with also some, some landings uh, by the Army uh, to, to, to make this work. And no such plan really ever existed or was, was really considered. The Allied Air Forces, the tactical air forces in particular, uh, Air Vice Marshal Conningham, I think Marshal Conningham at this time actually, did have a plan to turn on even strategic bombers to help with this, but they never initiated the full plan as well. Um, what I'll also say is the German units that did escape uh, did suffer heavy losses in the fighting on the mainland, and I'll get to that in a second. There are a number of routes, escape routes. These are the German escape routes. The Italian escape routes um, aren't on here. But you have four different main routes that they used during Operation Lair Gang to, to ferry their troops and supplies across. And the German evacuation ultimately was able to get, you know, almost 39,000 men, 10,000 vehicles, including 94 assault guns and 50 tanks, and almost 15,000 tons of fuel, ammunition, and equipment out. And that was in the kind of period that the evacuation took place, which was August 11th to August 17th. So the span of just short, shy of a week. Uh, but again, you're talking about very small, uh, very small distances here with a lot of anti-aircraft guns crammed into a narrow area. The Navy was a little skittish. They did send in some like motor torpedo boats and that sort of thing, especially at night, uh, but they were only so effective. They, they really, really what was needed was a physical barrier. You needed the Navy to really just put itself and impose itself in between. Uh, but to some degree, I can understand why they decided not to do that. Messina was a significant um, naval base uh, for the um, Italians uh, throughout the war, before the war. Uh, there were a lot of coastal defenses in this area, so I can understand to some extent the Navy's, um, you know, aversion to risk. Um, you also have to consider at this time, by this time, the Allies also know that they're going to be landing in mainland Italy. There's a good chance of that, and they probably don't want to be losing significant assets in advance of that either. So there's a little bit of that going on, I think, as well. Um, this is where I get into the kind of impact of the flak. Um, so. As you can see uh, here, you've got the uh, Tactical Air Force's anti-shipping claims for the, the relevant period, 23 destroyed, 43 direct hits, a lot of near misses. And they don't necessarily, the Tactical Air Force has, you know, <laughs> they have, you know, Kitty Hawk fighter bombers with, you know, 30 cal machine guns and, you know, 500 pound bombs, 250 pound bombs. Spitfires with 20 millimeter cannons. Um, you know, it's the big difference there uh, with 303 machine guns. Uh, some some of the Spitfires could have bombs too, but you know, very similar. It's not like they they didn't exactly have like rocket firing bolt fighters or anything like that that the British in particular had. You know, out of the UK, they didn't necessarily have the coastal air forces would have had some of that specialized equipment. I'm not sure how many you know rockets they would have had or anything like that in this theater, but they're not based you know really close enough to 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 have a big impact here. You know. Wellingtons and stuff like that could do it, but you know, not necessarily stuff you know back that was meant to be defending the coasts in, in North Africa and everything like that. So we're really talking about a limited capability here, um, and you can see that from you know the anti-aircraft fire is probably you know affecting the aim of some of these pilots as well. The amount yeah. of near misses they they made you know over 250 attacks on these vessels, but they hardly hit any. And then you can see, actually, the 23 destroyed lines up quite well with the German ferry vessel losses. There's two reporting uh, groups. There's Colonel Bade, who was in charge of the um, basically Fortress Messina, the, the, the garrison. And then there's Captain von Liebenstein, who was in charge of the actual ferry vessels themselves. So they're not, they don't, you know, von Liebenstein controls all the, all the vessels. There's not two sets of vessels or anything like that, but they're both reporting very similar numbers of losses, 25 in the case of Colonel Bade. 23 in the case of von Liebenstein, and he's also reporting damage. So, you know, these claims seem quite fairly accurate. And what I would also indicate to you is that if you were to plot all of these successful attacks on a map, most of them are occurring outside of the flak cone. They're occurring when the Germans are sending their ferry vessels up the coast 
uh, to get things up closer to Naples and stuff like that. They're not necessarily occurring in the Straits. And so that flat cone is having a significant impact. So I argue that the tactical Air Force put in a good effort, but ultimately it wasn't enough and that their accuracy suffered in the face of anti-aircraft fire. Um, now, the tactical Air Force basically was on its own for this effort. They never called in daylight heavy bombers. There's some disagreement in the literature over whether this would have made a huge difference or not. The Germans were not evacuating in a porch. They were evacuating over open beaches. And so, you know, how much impact would it have had? It's, it's unknown. What I can say is that Wellingtons operating at night, uh, medium bombers, uh, RAF and RCAF badged, um, did see some success in their attacks early on because they were attacking some of the, the beach areas and, and, and these landing grounds that the Germans were using. And this actually, originally, the German plan was that the evacuation would take place only at night because they were worried about the Allied air, air power and everything like that. But then at night, they were starting to get delays because of these Wellington attacks, you know, doing some damage, but certainly just making it very dangerous to, you know, get vehicles on and off, unload vehicles, and everybody was, you know, jumping for slip trenches and things like that, you know, uh, leaving the vehicles out in the open, what have you. And so they actually decided to switch to daylight because they had confidence in that flat cone. And this is one thing I will say that the Germans in particular did very well for this campaign. They planned this in advance. They had already, you know, a lot of these scary units and everything were from North Africa. They've been operating in North Africa for, for, for you know, the, the, the desert war and everything like that. And they brought them here to Sicily and they built this route to supplement the fact that the Allies had basically destroyed the conventional ferries and the routes there. And then they, they shoved a whole bunch of anti-aircraft assets into it to, I would argue, contest Allied air superiority in a limited area. And, and, and in that, they were successful. You know, I have to give them credit for that. Um, but I do argue that overall, um, and I'm going to skip ahead on that one, um, the Axis withdrawal may have been a morale victory, but that's all I think it was. Um, there were heavy losses for the German army in the battle, and that does call the completeness of this withdrawal into some, into some question. They are able to get their wounded away, and that's about 15,000 men. But that's a huge number. 5,000 killed, 15,000 wounded. They only had four divisions, you know, army divisions fighting in this in this campaign. And sure, there were some other, you know, support troops and the Luftwaffe and everything like that. But the fighting was really you know, heavy and really deadly for those Germans that were at the front line and involved in that. And they did lose a significant number of prisoners of war as well, you know, over 6,000. Mm. Italian casualties in Sicily... You know, those killed and wounded numbers are much smaller because the preponderance of the Italian units were, you know, coastal divisions, you know, uh, local territorial type units. Um, but I, I don't want to sell, sell the Italians short completely. I think a lot of the local units, you know, were willing to surrender fairly quickly and go home. But a lot of the main regular army Italian units did try to fight quite hard. And even though early in the campaign, a lot of them were, you know, uh, were very shocked quite quickly by you know the, the allied response they did help the germans form that main defensive line and hold parts of it and so the germans are always backstopped by italian forces throughout yeah. this campaign i think martin Morgan that, made the point that yeah there are as many there are as many occasions of italians doing reasonably well holding up as there are italians doing really badly but we tend to focus yeah. on as david O'Keefe said the kind of the jokey idea of them all being hopeless and yes the coastal units with their first world war pattern helmets and all sorts of obsolete weapons weren't much cop but the four italian divisions in land that's the that's as julio said that they they could have presented more of a threat than they did. They did in places show signs of it, and there's some bad leadership, and there's some bad decisions, and the Germans are making some bad decisions, and 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 and, and they're caught between a rock and a hard place of do they counterattack and try and push the beachhead back towards Jailer and places like that, or on the Canadian, or do they kind of hold on the high ground? As Mark told told us about, you know, the, the, yeah. the first Canadian division had some real tough battles by the Germans, just and the Italians in some way, just kind of placing themselves in a defensive position here and then moving back and doing the same thing again. So there's to just dismiss the Italians as being hopeless is, 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 yeah. is never the right, it's never the right option in terms of their world war two performance. I think. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And in this case, you know, I think in particular, my understanding is their artillery was, was actually quite good as well. And that really helped to, again, bulk up the German units, which, you know, a lot of them lost some of their artillery to, to defend the straits, right? And so some yeah. of that extra artillery was valuable for defending some of those mountain passes and things like that as well. Um, I'll just wrap up very quickly here in terms of Air Force losses. So 
The Germans are losing, the Luftwaffe loses some 1,600 aircraft between May and August 1943 in the entirety of the Mediterranean theater. So that's another big chunk, right? I said 2,400 kind of during the Operation Torch period sort of thing. It cost them that much to keep, you know, the fight in the Mediterranean going for six months. Well, May, June, July, August, four more months, 1,600 more aircraft. Hard to know how many air crew, but, you know, significant. And then the Regia Aeronautica during this, during a similar period, a little bit of a shorter period, you know, 800. And, and, and photos like these, this is uh, the main airfield at uh, Catania, I believe. Um, you know, lots of Italian aircraft in this case, you know, left in various states of, of destruction uh, and damage. Um, and, and of course, the Allies are starting to clean up all this infrastructure very quickly and turning it around to use it to their, their own advantage. Um, I also must mention Italian casualties to bombing. Um, so 2,500 or so, you know, pre-armistice Italian military bombing casualties. So military forces uh, killed in bombing in, in Italy. Um, and then the civilian uh, Italian casualties as well, you know, 18,000 uh, civilian deaths in Sicily during Operation Husky. Not all of those would be caused by air bombardments. There would be other causes as well, but I'm sure a, a significant, you know, majority of them will probably result in air, in air bombardments. One of the things the Allies tried to do and again, this is a theme you'll see, you know, throughout the war is, you know, because they're, the, the, the Allied armies are fighting through these hilltop towns with limited routes through them. Uh, one of the things the Allies are trying to do, because the Germans are going to do this anyway, they feel they're going to, you know, blow a hole in the road and, and, and force the Allies to stop and fill it in and whatever. And they're, you know, blowing bridges and things like that is the Allies actually bomb those towns while the Germans are still in them. They try to collapse the roadways on, you know, the buildings onto the, the narrow streets to try to prevent the Germans from getting away. And, you know, there's probably a limited effectiveness in that, but, you know, they do in some cases kill some Germans, but I'm sure they're killing a lot of Italian civilians in the process, yeah. right? Because they're directly targeting uh, their, their homes. Allied losses over the period, it's it's kind of difficult to come to, a, a, you know, a full accounting of this, at least from the, the, the sources that I've looked at. But between the 1st of July and the 17th of August, 1943, you know, 400 Allied aircraft lost. Not unreasonable to double this if we want to include May and June as well, I think. So the Allies are losing a significant number of aircraft in pursuit of these goals, but nothing in the manner of what the uh, the Axis are losing. And again, uh, you know, they're flying, you know, hundreds of different sorties and missions, you yeah. know, on a daily or weekly basis. And can replace them. And can replace them. And, you know, again, they're not losing 50 aircraft in one mission or anything like that. They're not doing, yeah. there's an impact of the Ploesti raid that happens in August 1943. Yeah, it of means some of the heavy bombers are not available to deal perhaps with Messina. I think they send out like 50 bombers and like maybe 100 of them come back, but 50 of those are not, you know, serve, like they're junk basically. So, you know, two thirds of the force lost on, on a single raid. And that's not the sort of thing that's happening here. You know, supporting the army um, in Sicily and by attacking enemy railways and systems in mainland Italy. So it's a very cost effective way of doing business, I suppose, you know, on a, on a relative scale anyway. Um, the last thing I'll say, and then I'll open it up to questions for sure, is um, basically on that point that I just left off, a uh, little bit of an anecdote. So on one occasion, Air Chief Marshal Sir Charles Portal, the professional head of the Royal Air Force, wrote to uh, Tedder, and he noted that it was the bomber offensive against Germany from the UK that is, quote, largely responsible for the support superiority which your command now enjoys, end quote. And Tedder responded, he felt this was unacceptable. He said, he said, quote, I am, however, a little surprised to see it is considered that bomber offensive from UK is largely responsible for our local superiority. When I remember the air ministry assessment that German fighter wastage in the Mediterranean in July was the highest monthly total this war and was about three quarters total fighter production, end quote. So there's a strategic, you know, I've talked about the strategic implications yeah. of all this, what the Air Force is trying to do. Again, it's not just about taking territory in Sicily. It's about knocking Italy out of the war. The Air Force is directly playing a role there. And in the process of doing all of this, they're really grinding down the German Air Force in the Southern theater. And that that's a huge offshoot for what's going on here. So that's why I argue that the invasion of Sicily should be viewed as a victory for our European strategy, as a necessary step in the defeat of fascist Italy and Nazi Germany. At this point, Italy was on the path to surrender. Germany had already taken on the task of defending Southern Europe, and Allied air power played a crucial role in these achievements. And that's that's my argument, and, and, and I stick by it <laughs> all these years after I, I wrote that book. 
because I did the work on it, you know, between, you know, 10 and five years ago. So uh, it was a really great book to, to write. And, uh, and I'm glad I was able to do that. And then, as I said to you before we came on this, I'm glad that some of those ideas have percolated into what yeah, I mean, James, is doing. James and references and you in his book, doesn't he? Which is good. And, that, yeah. and, that, and it's, and, and it allows us to re, re, reanalyze some of these events. And you know, before we, I've got a few questions I've starred from the views and you, but you might, you know, takeaways is Kevin Hemel very, um, successfully said yesterday that there's lots of context we have to take and you know the Messina the, the the Messina for example the Americans maybe are a bit risk averse at this point they've they've still they're still a bit wounded by Kasserine back in North Africa they don't want to kind of push their push their confidence too much they've got to get a victory and a smaller victory is that you're going to get is maybe better to get than a possible big victory and that, that that's that's affecting their confidence I mean that came up there. Then there's there, there's the whole difficulty of getting navy into the straits. Blah blah blah. That came up. So that Messina story. There's multiple factors there, and just dismissing it and saying it was Allied failure, as you said there. Yeah. Is, is, think, is not, in is part, it's, it's in part it's German success, and, and yeah, they yeah, thought exactly. ahead, and they thought this is probably what's going to happen. So we better, you know, to give them some credit logistically here. They they figured out we need to secure that communications point, or we're going to be screwed. And, and they did that. And what I will say, I'll, I'll just comment on that notion that um, you know, the G Americans were risk adverse. It depends what you're talking about. The uh, American Air Forces, you know, um, spots and, and, and everything, they were still really keen on hitting, you know, Romanian oil, right? So they were willing to go True. out and spend plenty of air crews lives on targets like that. Um, and in some ways that had impacts on, you know, this campaign, right? Uh, because there's, you know, those those were Ninth Air Force, I think it was, I can't remember the Air Force, but it was, it was B-24s that were part of the overall command, but were kind of separated out and they were in North Africa and they went after other targets. And one of those targets was, was the Romanian oil field. So, yeah, there's 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 different things going on here. And 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 I guess another theme that is, you know, evident probably in some of your other talks, but is evident here is a lot of the lessons learned, again, they're not doing this operation to learn lessons, but they're learning lessons as they do it. And Sully Zuckerman, who I referenced early on and then didn't really come back to him, this is the first opportunity where the Allies get to take over a European railway system after they bombed it to see what the heck they did do it. Mm -hmm. Right? So we've got Sicily and eventually they get southern Italy too. And so Sully Zuckerman goes in with you know, all his boffins and whatever, and does studies, operational research studies, and says, you know, how effective were we? What were we doing? And and they indicated that, you know, by and large, the Allied Air Forces were able to paralyze the Sicilian railway network and the Southern Italian railway network during various phases of this, this operation. And that has an after effect because Tedder, who is, you know, deputy to Eisenhower for Normandy, and Sully Zuckerman's his main scientific advisor, that's the policy they're pursuing down the road because they see that it's worked here. The railway networks are very different in Central Europe and, and Western Europe than they are from Southern Europe here, right? It's, it's yeah. a much more limited railway network, but the theory has been tested and shown to work to a great extent. And so that's, so there's influences that are happening here that, that, that percolate down the road, you know, for other operations uh, in the future and um, you know, it's 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 not just the simple things like you know friendly fire and trying to deal with those issues as well. It's 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 things like the the transportation plan. Yeah, no, I mean, and that has been another big recurring theme is torch, uh, not uh, husky. Um, they're all part of this getting to be able to win war more effectively, more economically, uh, less human lives lost, more you know use more use of, of, of technology and steel, and it's all. It's all part of it. And and studying just Husky without looking at Torch is kind of missing some of the point. Looking at Norm Overlord without looking at Husky before it is kind of missing the point. Looking at Sicily without looking at you know Salerno and Anzio later on is kind of missing some things. It's all it's all connected. It's all connected. But we'll just do there's more questions than we can handle because we've got to go off and do other things. But this is an interesting one from Sean Brennan. If the Axis had had to make major efforts to get Sicilian mm -hmm. airfields working pre-invasion, how much allied effort was required to make them operational once they've taken them over? Yeah, I mean, significant efforts, you know, they had uh, servicing commandos go in, you know, right away, you know, kind of, not maybe the second wave, but follow up waves to the landing forces to start to get things figured out. There's one instance where um, there's a small airfield at uh, Pekino where the Canadians land, and they capture that on the 10th of July. Um, on the 11th of July, it's able to be opened as an emergency landing strip because they brought in bulldozers and they, you know, 
the, even the Italians have gone in and ripped up the runways and stuff. But it's a lot of these runways aren't necessarily um, they're not at asphalt or anything like they're not necessarily hard yep. surface runways yep. in many cases. So it's it's a little bit easier to get those at least landing strips back in order and everything, and to bring in your own supplies and everything. And so uh, George Noel Keith, who we talked about throughout that call, actually he ran out of gas because he was too busy shooting up uh, German and Italian aircraft over the landing areas. And actually had to land at Pequino and get refueled before he went back to Malta. So, you know, relatively early on, they're able to start using those as emergency airfields. Mm. And then as the days and weeks go on, it's really when you get to kind of early August where everything's starting to be set up and ready to go. And, um, you know, as the as the Allies get closer and closer to Catania as well, the Air Forces are able to kind of move even closer and closer to the front, and even closer and closer ultimately to the mainland as well uh, to bring their range up. But I will also say, you know, for their part, the Germans still did try to do things at night in particular, um, you know, with night bombers trying to attack ports and, and they knew where all the aerodromes were. So they're also bombing these aerodromes. Um, and so in some cases, there was actually some damage done to the uh, the Allied Air Forces on the ground, even later in the campaign uh, with these efforts, because, you know, night fighters are great, but they they can't stop everything. Right. Like, yeah, they're given, you know, they're individual fighters given a sector to work with. And there's another night fighter a couple of kilometers away, given its sector to work with. And so if 50 bombers come at once, they can't deal with everything at once. Right. Because they, they need to be separated so they don't shoot at yep. each other. <laughs> so that's some of the, the difficulties. And the German Air Force is still resilient. But again, there, there's a cost for them doing those operations. And, and the, cra the cracks are showing in the jump. And so just a couple of questions about the Luftwaffe, in fact, and then one more about about Messina. So. Um, I'll do uh, the Great Dominions first. So it's what was the extent of night intruder operations mm. from Malta targeting Luftwaffe night fighters and bombers at the home airfields on Sicily and elsewhere before and op uh, during Operation Husky? Um, so that's from the Allied point of view, but we've also had questions about similar from the German point of view about what were their night operations. So um, if you want to handle that kind of general night yeah. operation, we just kind of have a bit, haven't you? But Yeah, I think, I think, I mean, I think the Germans, generally speaking, they don't have as many night fighters in theater because they're, they're kind of busy up in, you know, uh, the Western Front, if you will. Uh, but I'm sure there were some operating for sure. Um, the Allies, I think, from the research I did, there, there were intruder operations for sure, uh, especially probably more, more so before um, uh, the invasion. But of course, you know, during the first few weeks of the invasion, which is where my research focused in terms of the night fighter effort. Um, those night fighters are very much doing, you know, uh, combat air patrols uh, because right. they're they're needed to to protect the ports, to protect the landing areas, and everything like that. So certainly there were, uh, but again, I think part of that too to consider is again the German fighter, the German bomber force, the Italian bomber force are mainly based up towards Naples and even further north. Yeah. So those night fighters don't always necessarily have the range. They they do have the range, but it's not. They're not as close as they would probably want to be to do that to make it to make fun. a difference. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then David O'Keefe, not quite a final word to him, but is mm. this the last hurrah of the Luftwaffe in a tactical role? Interesting. I mean, it's probably one of the last major hurrahs. It's definitely the last. Uh, this is this is termed. Um, I'm trying to remember what the Americans uh, Williamson Murray termed this as the the last or the the greatest air battle of the Mediterranean War. And so I think from that perspective. In the Mediterranean, it's almost the last hurrah of, of the Luftwaffe. Now, they do come out, though, and they do try to do some significant things around Anzio. They do try to do some significant things around Salerno as well. So it's not that they're not there later on. It's not that they don't make attempts to do things. Um, it's just that this is kind of their last, this is the last time they really, you know, throw everything in and see if they can make a huge difference to, to stop something. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and and and, I, and I'd have to do more work on the later the later battles. But and I, I mean, I think we do underestimate in some ways the resilience of the Luftwaffe, especially the resilience of the Luftwaffe on night arms in yeah. terms of what they're doing. I mean, even in Normandy, they're trying to have an influence at the tactical level. They probably just don't have the numbers to have the, you know, a big enough influence, but they are there. I, um, I attended Russell Hart's lecture in San Diego in March about the Luftwaffe and normally, and he's, you know, he gave you some of the data of the amount of operations they're mounting. And yeah, it's, they're trying, they're really trying. It's just yes. not quite big enough to really make more than a dent. It's significant. And anyone yeah. who says there's no it's job definitely, Luftwaffe it normally definitely is wrong. Bugs. It definitely bugs. Like I know I've read a lot of the Canadian war diaries. It bugs a lot of the Canadian artillery units and stuff because yeah. they're getting yeah, bombed, yeah. you know, south of Caen and stuff in July and August, 1944. So 
the Luftwaffe is still there. It's still doing a job. But in this case, it was meant to be maybe almost the most important arm in terms of what the Germans were going to do to try to defend Sicily, and it was unable to do so. And so in that yeah. way, yeah, it's a significant, uh, you know, last last throw of the dice yeah. for the Luftwaffe. And then the and last question. It's question. certainly very frustrating for the pilots and the air crew themselves in the Luftwaffe who were trying to make a difference and just knew that they couldn't. Okay, and the last question, it really, we've kind of answered already, it's from Sean Brennan, and we're back to the Messina Straits again. Could night airdrop sea mines have made difficulties mm -hmm. for the Axis without needing to hit individual barges and ferries? And we had the same thing on Kevin's thing about could we have used MTBs or mm -hmm. some kind of PT boat thing where you don't have to worry about the harbour so much. But I'm going to kind of answer it my way, then I'll let you answer it in your way. To me, yeah. that again is answered by the fact that the Germans have planned this in advance, whereas the Allies are getting to this point quite quickly. And sure, there are lots, maybe lots of things with hindsight, if they had thought about it, oh, that would have worked. Maybe, as you said there, some amphibious, you know, land some commandos, do some things there. But it's all, it, it, it wasn't thought of in advance, and it all comes together quite quickly. But yeah, I'm interested in your take on, yeah, yeah, yes is the answer. It could be, but. Yeah, I, I think it could be. I think one of the questions I would have, and I don't know enough about air sea mines and, and how they work, but were the Siebel ferries and the smaller vessels that the Axis were using, would they have, triggered a lot of those different types of mines that the allies had in their arsenal. I don't, I don't know the answer to that because these are very small, relatively small craft. Um, yeah, I think, you know, perhaps they could have made a difference. Um, I'm sure in some cases the allies were laying mines, the coastal air forces probably were laying mines, but I think the big numbers that the allies are able to do this with in Northwest Europe were for bomber command, right? Bomber yeah. command was able to lay far more yeah. mines. Yeah. Than we did a show on it. Yeah. Command, right? Right, and so they don't have that capability in the in the, in theater. Yeah, yeah, no, in it's, it's it's interesting, and we will bring things then because we've been chatting away for nearly an hour and a half there. But Alex, you know, it, your your passion for telling the air the air story is is coming through, and and it you know, the, the basic <laughs> thing is there's still more we could talk about. You know, anyone who just kind of dismisses and says, "Oh, there's like, there's nothing to there's lots to still talk about." There's still debates to be had. You know, you know we know there's debates to be had about DF. Uh, market garden normally yeah. but there are still debates about sicily as well and and things that are not quite resolved yet there's still the next generation of historians will do a dig dig through a little bit further through the weeds and maybe pull out some more stuff and it'll still be discussed so um yeah so great so we'll right. we'll we'll bring you back on perhaps later in the year and we can and we can do something about the juno center again and what you're doing there but right now it's been fantastic talking to you and thanks for all the questions everybody and um Folks, I will see you on Monday when we are talking about the COP parties with two members of the Malta Living History Association. We're going to talk about okay. all through that. It'll be really cool. Really cool. So did you enjoy talking to our Motley crew, Alex? Oh, I sure did. It was a great audience. Really great questions, many of which obviously stumped me a little bit. Uh, so thank you for everybody's participation. Brilliant. Thanks, everybody. See you all on Monday. It's Paul with us for World War II TV. Say so enjoy the rest of your weekend. Cheers, everybody. Bye.